AI's role in creating new Beatles music, trends in the enterprise technology space, and the life of a junior consultant. Those are just a few of the topics we're going to cover today in episode number 127 of Transformation Ground Control. This is Transformation Ground Control. Your source for all things business, technology, strategy, and change. If you're growing your business, leading change within your organization, or undertaking any sort of operational or technology change initiative, this podcast is for you. This show covers what you need to know about digital transformation, organizational change, operational improvement, and business growth. Five, four, three, two, one. And now, here's your host, Eric Kimberly. Hello, welcome to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. This is the podcast that has everything to do with digital transformation, including the people, process, technology, and strategy sides of transformation. My name is Eric Kimberling, your host today, as well as the CEO of Third Stage Consulting. We're an independent consulting firm that helps clients throughout the world reach their third stage of digital transformation success. And with me, as always, is my co-host, Kyler Cheatham. Kyler, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks. Happy to be here today. Happy to have you here today and happy to have the audience from all over the world joining. Thank you for being here. Uh, just as a reminder, you can find new episodes of this podcast every Wednesday. It streams to LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can also find uh, new episodes on audio podcast platforms throughout the world, including Apple Podcasts, Amazon, Google, etc. So be sure to check us out there. We've got a great show for you today in episode number 127. We're going to open the segment uh, talking through some audience questions, and we'll get to those answers to those questions. We're also going to talk about some hot topics, including um, how AI has allowed the Beatles to make new music, uh, which is super interesting because two of the four Beatles are dead. So it, it's, it's interesting to hear that we could actually hear new Be Beatles music regardless. So I'm curious to hear more about that. Uh, we're going to talk about solving the data question. So as it relates to data within digital transformation, we'll talk about that as well. And then later in the show, we'll have our first guest, who is John Reed, who is the co-founder and one of the editors at Diginomica, which is a enterprise tech-based uh, website. It covers uh, news and analysis and opinions related to enterprise technology. He started that company or that outlet about 10 years ago. They just celebrated their 10-year anniversary. So we wanted to have him on the show to talk about trends in the enterprise tech space, sort of doing a review of where we've come, what's changed, what hasn't changed, and how we got to where we are, as well as, more importantly, where we're headed in the future. So be sure to stick around for that. He's always a, a very engaging uh, host or a, an engaging guest to have on the show. Uh, he's been on the show before in the past, so be sure to check that out. And then last but not least, our, our last guest will be uh, Jordy McDougall from the Third Stage Consulting team. He's going to be chatting with Kyler about uh, sort of a rising star in consulting, talking about life of a junior consultant. So Jordy will be on to talk about what life is like as a junior consultant. And uh, it's always interesting to hear uh, someone who's just starting out and what their their view of the world is and uh, hopefully get to the good, the bad, the ugly of, of the consulting industry and the consulting career. But before we get to our guest, uh, let's get to some of the, the questions you've got for us from our audience here, Kyler. Absolutely. Well, let's get into it. Um, if you put a comment or a question on any of Eric's social media channels, um, I will ask it. I also go back and pull all of the questions in in this um, video here. So go ahead and pop any questions you may have for him in the chat. I also want to hear your answers to the questions. Um, so definitely uh, engage there too, as we have such a great community that has amazing insight. So I'm excited to hear from Eric and all of you. So. This is a question um, that talks about when a transformation gets into full swing, it's easy to stop selling and reselling the reason why it's happening. How do you keep that constant alignment? That's a really good question. I love that question because that, that dynamic that that person described is so true and so powerful and so real as far as, you know, you sell it, you get the justification, you get people excited early on, and then you put your head down and you just start doing stuff. And when I say you, I mean, you know, the project team, the whole organization, and they, they end up just sort of forgetting that, oh yeah, we need to justify this ongoing, you know, just to make sure that people understand where we're headed and why we're going the way we are and, and to keep that alignment you talk about. So a lot of this comes from, first of all, listening to the organization and, and you, you have to make sure that you're keeping a pulse on the organization 
which is really hard to do. And it's a lot easier said than done. I fully acknowledge because when you're heads down building stuff and testing and doing data migration and figuring out how you're going to do training and, you know, you get so caught up in all these details that it's easy to forget, you know, to lift your head up and look around and say, okay, well, I should probably look and see, are we still aligned? Are people pushing back? Is there concern? Is there fear, uncertainty, doubt, all that stuff. And, um, chances are extremely high, if not a hundred percent, uh, high that the answer to that is yes, there is resistance. There's fear, uncertainty, and doubt there's misalignment. And a lot of times we don't have time to deal with that, or we feel like we don't have time to deal with that. So it's important that we do. So one of the best ways to do that is to do uh, periodic organizational readiness assessments to really keep a pulse quantitatively and qualitatively on where the organization is headed and where the pockets of resistance are and where the concerns are so that you can then be generating or, or focusing on really targeted messaging and targeted problem solving, if you will, as it relates to that organizational misalignment. So those are that's probably the best way if I were to give one piece of advice, it would be to do those organizational assessments, which are typically online quantitative surveys, as well as in-person focus groups. So you get both the quantitative and qualitative uh, feedback, and then you take those inputs and you start to assess and analyze where those risks are. And of course, that's something that uh, a service we provide here at Third Stage, but it's, it's also something you could do yourself if you're if you're experienced in that realm. And what would you say, just building on this topic, if a vendor was like, hey, I'll come in and assess this for you, what's the importance of independence in those project health checks? Yeah, great question. And that's something we will talk about with our guests later with John Reed from Diginomica, you know, the importance of having an independent voice uh, in your transformation. Um, but it, it's very important because, you know, you think about it, a software vendor, first of all, a software vendor or a system integrator or an implementer is very focused and generally speaking, going to be pretty solid and, and qualified in terms of deploying technology. They are not, however, nearly as experienced, generally speaking, as as it relates to change management and really understanding where the pockets of resistance are and that sort of thing. So having independence and also specialized voices, like specialized people that, that know change management really well and they can help with that piece of it is, is really important. The other thing too is software vendors, just because of the way the industry is built and the way their business models are built, their their role is generally not to bring out the risks or to escalate the risks to the bring it to the surface. Generally speaking, they're not going to be good at, nor are they going to want to or find it in their best interest, at least in the short term, to identify all these organizational risks. They don't want to create alarm or concern, so they usually are going to focus more on the technology for those two reasons. So um, that's why you know that's why it is important that you take that suggestion with a with a high grain of salt, a high degree of a grain of salt, um, because generally speaking, those parties aren't going to be nearly as good at it. Yes, absolutely. Well, excellent question and great insight there. Oh, I got, got two stuck together here. Um, so this one is uh, the role, the roles and responsibilities video that you did on TikTok. If you don't follow Eric on TikTok, highly recommend it. Great digestible content there. Um, so stakeholder management is the most important part of a PM's role. Memos for records are key. So I wanted to give you a chance to kind of elaborate on that um, from the overall roles and responsibilities of a project manager specifically in a digital transformation project. Well, it sort of uh, ties back to that previous question around, you know, keeping alignment and continuously selling the project and justifying the project to the organization. That's very much related to this question, which is how what is the role that a PM should take in terms of keeping stakeholders engaged and aligned and that sort of thing. And at the very least, keeping them informed of what's going on uh, in the project. And so I would say, yes, the project manager's role is, is uh, largely um, external outside the team, as well as internal, you know, managing the immediate transformation team. So um, I'd say, yeah, you, you need to identify all those stakeholders, executive stakeholders, mid-level management stakeholders and leaders. Um, certainly, you know, those, influencers that maybe aren't high up in the organization, but everyone knows them. They've been around for a long time and they just have a lot of influence in the organization. Those are the stakeholders that we're talking about. And, and oftentimes, quite frankly, it's so much stakeholder management that no one person can do it and still do their other job, which is to manage the project and, and sort of the inner workings of the project. So that's where your change team can help with that too, to give you some scale and to make sure that it's not just the project manager, because it's also the executive team too. You know, the executive team not only needs to manage, you know, be managed, but they also have to manage and be the face of the change to the rest of the organization. And so oftentimes it ends up being a behind the scenes role 
if you're a project manager or a change manager, you're sort of oftentimes behind the scenes, uh, helping lead from behind, if you will, to ensure that the executives can be that face to the company and provide the messaging and the clarity that the organization needs. Absolutely. It sounds like they're very, very related, those two questions. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's do one more. Um, so this one is from one of your YouTube uh, videos recently about customization. Um, and it's a comment, but I wanted to get kind of ask the question. Um, the more you customize, the harder to maintain, um, the harder it is to maintain, I should say. With cloud software, you actually can't customize. And it's amazing how many people don't know that. Is that true? I wouldn't say you can't customize. I mean, there it, it of course depends on what which cloud software you're talking about. But I would say it's very true that there are significant limitations to cloud customization when you compare it to the old on-premise customization. So, you know, when it's on-prem, you could do pretty much, and I, I mean this literally, you could do literally anything you wanted to the software. You, if you want to break it, you can break it. If you want to, you know, create all these extensions and capabilities that the software was never meant to do, you can do it for better or for worse. And some people like it and some people get into a lot of trouble because they over customize and that sort of thing. So I'm not going to get into a debate of whether customization is right or wrong because there's sort of two answers to that. But when it comes to, to cloud, um, I think the cloud is getting better. It's getting more flexible than it was say 10 or 20 years ago. More vendors are starting to focus on creating the, um, the more of a platform and a, and a tool set that can be used to to change the software. You've got the whole low code, no code movement. You've got um, highly configurable platforms and that sorts of thing. That sort of thing. But having said that, um, there are much more guardrails in place for better or for worse that that sort of limit the amount of customization, which could be a good thing in many cases. But in some cases, it just it constrains you a bit, and that's where you have to start thinking about you know what do I do if I can't customize the software. And configuring isn't going to get me where I need to go with that specific functionality within a technology, then what do I do? Do I go, you know, do I just live with it and just water down my own processes? Do I go find a third party bolt on? You know, there's a lot of different answers you could go with, but um, it's, it's that's a great point. Absolutely. Well, um, I know in our Hot Topics, we're going to cover software optimization a little bit more, but thank you to our audience for those questions. And again, if you have feedback or answers or have questions for our next episode, go ahead and pop those in the comments right now. Yeah, sounds great. Great questions. I appreciate all the engagement we always get on our various social media channels. So thank you for that. Uh, we're going to come back in a second. We're going to chat through some Hot Topics. We're going to chat through how AI is helping the Beatles make new music. We're going to solve the data question. And then later in the show, we'll have our first guest, who's going to be John Reed, the co-founder of Diginomica. We'll talk about trends in the enterprise technology space. And then later in the show, in the third segment, we'll have Jordy McDougall from the Third Stage Consulting Team. Uh, he's a recent addition to our team, and he's going to talk about life as a junior consultant. So stick around for that. Uh, we'll be right back. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, Contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Tiedem. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So thank you for being here today. So Kyler, you've got a couple hot topics for us today. What's in store in terms of the world of, of technology and new trends and interesting stuff? Well, first of all, I'm not going to solve the data problem. So let's oh. just release that. I, I like to say we unrealistic expectations. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Well, let's talk about the Beatles first. I know I kind of teased this in the last episode, but wanted to get 
your feedback on this as, you know, a real music purist. Um, we had a conversation a few weeks back about vinyl records, and I thought it would be an interesting piece to um, dive into. So Sir Paul McCartney has announced that a new Beatles song will be released later this year. And because of artificial intelligence, it will feature the entire group. So the, how they did that is they were able to find a recording that John Lennon made in 1978 and gifted that tape to Sir McCartney. And because of the AI, they were actually able to isolate his voice and his piano playing and give the opportunity for the actual software to recreate it. Um, so they will be releasing that, and it's caused a lot of different controversy within the industry, which we already know artificial intelligence in the use of music is a very hot topic. So I had to get your feedback as not only a technology thought leader, but also a music fan on what you think. Are you excited about that? Do you think it's kind of um, half-hearted in pure music because it's not the actual star it's more um, artificial what it what's your take on it great question uh, i don't have a strong reaction to it because i guess um i haven't heard the song yet i mean i suppose it, it depends on how it sounds if i i'll put it this way if i hear the song and it sounds like even though i know it's not but if it sounds like it could be the beatles and i and i sort of believe it and I like it, then I have no problem with it. I think it's kind of cool. I think it's cool that the Beatles are embracing it. And what's fascinating about it, though, is too, is that both, you know, Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr are the only two that are alive. John Lennon is obviously dead, and so is George Harrison. So the fact that, you know, and, and by the way, they both tour still. I know John Lennon still, or um, Paul McCartney still tours. I think Ringo Starr still tours as well. So it's interesting because they're in their 80s and they're out there making music still. So it, it's kind of interesting that they're not just somehow you know what I mean? Like creating it themselves, even though half of them wouldn't be able to contribute. Um, but I think it's pretty cool that they're doing that. You know, someone is, is late in their careers as they are and so legendary are willing to embrace AI and see what happens. So I, I think it's actually pretty cool. I can't say I would like the song, I suppose, but, um, you know, we'll kind of see how it sounds. Well, interesting. I'm, I'm curious to hear from our audience. Do you feel like this new music is positive or do you think they should just let it be, if you will? <laughs> nice. See what I did I like there? like it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, but definitely exciting. And we'll share um, all of these, these different updates when it comes to uh, the song and maybe even have a live listening session here on the podcast so we can all engage in the feedback. I was going to say maybe um, we could play it on this but, show, but then again, I don't know who owns the yeah. copyright if – AI yeah. generated it. And I remember when Marcus Harris was on here, he's the attorney that we've had on mm -hmm. here before. He was talking about how there's certain rules around AI generated content and what's copyrighted and what's not. So um, that's a whole nother can of worms that we don't need to get into here today. But I'd be curious if it's not copyright protected, then maybe we could play it on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll have to get Marcus to do a consultation of if we can play it on <laughs> right. the show or what, what. But we've also talked about in that in the past of who owns that property. Is it the artist or is it the actual software that made it? And we, if you remember a few episodes back, and if you haven't listened to this, you should definitely um, search wherever you're getting this podcast for just the word Drake, because you'll find a, a couple different um, articles in which we've covered. Uh, Drake actually had a song that wasn't really Drake that topped the you know charts the music charts here in the united states so it was a big question of like who actually gets that revenue because it's a likeness of him but it's not actually him it's an ai mm -hmm. um software and i actually listened to the song it was really good interesting so. i'll have to check that out too i've not heard that all right well let's move to solving the data problem the unrealistic expectations that eric put on <laughs> us but really what we're talking about here is enterprise ai and the the integration of using AI. And one of the biggest limitations to implementing an artificial intelligence or any emerging technology is data. Data of the organization isn't mature enough, it's not clean enough, it's not optimized in order to use these, these systems because they are only as good and productive as the data that goes into them. So there's this, this concept of synthetic data, and I'm really excited to ask you about this. Um, Eric, and kind of talk about what this looks like and is this really an option if you do have a data management challenge? So synthetic data is artificially generated data that imitates real world data, but does not contain any personal identifiable information. 
So what it does is it is a supplement to incomplete data. It can take the inference of the existing data and build upon that. And so it can be inherently biased and there's areas in which there's privacy rest restrictions. But this kind of cognitive AI using synthetic data opens the door kind of for uncharted territories to build upon existing data or to optimize data that might get you to utilizing more emerging technologies. So wanted to get kind of your feedback on utilizing those tools to build out kind of that first step in actually implementing artificial intelligence in an enterprise ecosystem. Yeah, well, I think it's a whole the whole question or the whole thread is a good reminder of how important data is to make the potential value of AI a reality. And I don't know that people fully appreciate or understand that yet because you have organizations that have accumulated and in some cases hoarded mass amounts of data over years and decades. And then they go in and they put in AI or business intelligence or some sort of analytics tool and don't realize that those tools are great, but they're only as good as the data that they're drawing from. And if you don't do anything to clean up the data and, and have the right data sets in place, then it's it's not going to be of nearly as much value. In fact, it could be erroneous information you end up getting as outputs out of those systems if, if the data is inaccurate. So I think that's probably the biggest thing is just the, that general understanding of how important data is as, as a whole. Um, the synthetic data angles is an interesting one too, of course, but I think just understanding that and, and having a solid data strategy is, is so important to that realization of AI and the, the potential of, you know, emerging technologies. Absolutely. I'm curious to hear from the audience too about any experience around synthetic data or data management when it comes to implementing artificial intelligence into your organization, because it is kind of the most manual, if you will, of the processes. It can be really tedious, the data management processes, especially if you don't have that competency in-house um, and you don't know where to start because it's kind of an emerging area in which, yes, data has always been important, but now it's really king in the, the technical um, evolution of new, of new options within an enterprise technology stack. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear the audience's questions on that too. Or if you have experience with AI and data in, in particular and how you've addressed the data challenge, you know, to, to enable some of these more advanced technologies, I'd love to hear feedback on that as well. So really good stuff. Mm -hmm. well, very good. Well, uh, thank you for the, those, uh, those great hot topics. That's, those are two very interesting ones and uh, hopefully the audience uh, got the wheels, got their wheels turning as well mentally on, on those. Uh, we're going to shift gears, though, and take a quick break, although we will talk about AI some more and we'll talk about data some more as well uh, when we bring our first guest on to the show, which is uh, John Reed, who's the co-founder of Diginomica. He's going to be on talking about trends in the enterprise tech space. They, the uh, Diginomica media outlet just celebrated their 10-year anniversary, so we thought it'd be a great time to have him on the show to talk about where we've come over the last 10 years and, more importantly, where we're headed in the next 10 years. So be sure to stick around for that. And then at, later in the show, after John is on the show, we will have Jordy McDougall on to talk about the life of a junior consultant, what it's like to be a junior consultant and what his initial observations are. Uh, oh, to be young again like that. I, I, I still remember starting off as a consultant. And so I'm curious to hear what he has to say. So uh, we'll, we're will we going to have John on after the show, but first we'll take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. Could you whisper in my ear the things you want to feel? Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate, experience, and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So be sure to check us out and subscribe if you don't already. Uh, so our, our next guest is John Reed. He is the co-founder of Diginomica, 
in addition to being the co-founder of Diginomica, he's just been in this industry now for, I think, 25 years, about as long as I have, I believe, uh, starting in the mid 90s. Uh, he and I have known each other and sort of crossed paths over the last couple decades. And uh, he's a great guy, very knowledgeable. And he shares a uh, a similarly, I don't want to say jaded, I don't know if that's the right view, jaded or skeptical view of the enterprise technology space. Uh, he might be the only person I can name that might be more jaded than me um, in this space. And and I think he would probably agree that that he's at least as jaded, if not more jaded than me and, and more skeptical for sure. Um, but it, he recently, he and his organization, Diginomica, which is a media outlet, you, you can go to uh, Diginomica, it's D-I-G-I-N-O-M-I-C-A, we'll drop it in the chat as well, Diginomica.com. It's a great website, good for news, analysis, editorials, all that stuff related to enterprise technology. Uh, recently celebrated their 10-year anniversary. We thought it'd be great to have him on to talk about what's changed over the last 10 years, where are we at, how do we get to where we are in the enterprise tech space, and more importantly, where are we headed? What should we be thinking about as we go to the future? So uh, all that being said, John, welcome to the show. Tell us a little bit about your background. How, how did you grow up in this space and what's your background? Yeah, I mean, it, I, in the mid-90s, I was um, looking for a different angle in my career and I ended up uh, running um, an ERP recruiting firm and early on, I realized I was a pretty bad recruiter, <laughs> but I was pretty good at content. And so I proposed to my owner, let's, let's put out a bunch of content advising people about the market. And we built this pretty big website. We were almost acquired at one point there. And, but I think the big lesson for me, um, well, it was an early preoccupation with things like skills and training. Um, and those things really haven't gone away. <laughs> You know, right. when you peel back, when you peel back the veneer of, of project success, it's interesting how much, how jugular those core topics are. <laughs> yeah, it sounds kind of mundane in a way, but that you get to the heart of things really there. And, and then I just learned about the, the power of community, I guess, and the power of reaching people with, with, with like what you might call like authentic content or just being real with stuff. Um, and, and that that can really further relationships and it's one reason why you and I met and and you know meet so many friends that way but what you realize is there's there's a huge power there for customers as well to tap into wisdom and insights beyond company walls and I think that's been a really major positive trend in the market on, on the downside I, th I think there's still a lot of customers that don't take nearly as much advantage of that as they should but I think those were like the big light bulb moments. And then it, things just kind of evolved from there. And, you know, it, it took me a while to kind of grow up in this industry and figure out like exactly what my role should be. And, and that was the biggest thing about Diginomica was once I aligned myself with that team and founded that publication, that was when I kind of really said, oh, this is I found finally found my role in this industry, whereas before I was kind of flailing, but I was publishing a whole ton of content and it was mostly about themes of transformation. There was a lot of ERP, but quite a bit of CRM as well. And that's kind of stuck with it. Interesting. So that kind of gets back to the genesis of why, why you started it or why you wanted to, to start a publication or a media outlet like Diginomica was yeah, to, maybe. was it to provide that? sort of honest, authentic voice in the market? Was that really sort of what you were going for when, when you guys started Diginomica 10 years ago? Yeah, I mean, there were really there were really two big themes to why we started Diginomica. One was, one was um, exactly what you described, that we wanted to really document um, the realities of transformation on the ground and try to figure out how companies are successful and, and provide more context around that. And, you know, obviously we're, not the only firm that does that, but there's not that many. Um, you do it. Um, but one thing that we spend a lot of time on is very in-depth customer case studies that we publish that hopefully show like the re the real challenges as well as the success, because I think that's what's missing from the vendor libraries of, of right. studies is they gloss over the hard parts. And so we try to surface a little bit about like the challenges as well. And so that's always been a core. But then the other big thing was just that we wanted to try to build a model for media that wasn't page view driven and, you know, and and a really crappy reader experience. I mean, if you go on the big tech website still to this day, you're going to get pop up videos and, you know, all kinds of crap trying to get you to subscribe to this and that. And, and somewhere buried underneath that is like 
maybe a piece of content that maybe you can get to. And, and, and so, you know, we really try to keep, and I actually run our website. We've really tried to keep a clean interface and we added things like dyslexia mode and audio playback and stuff like that. But, but that's really more like inclusiveness sort of efforts, but in general, like really try to keep the interface lean, mean, mobile friendly. And like, so readers can just really focus on, on content. And I remember one of our co-founders was like, you know, why am I competing with gadget reviews on tech sites for like hundreds of thousands of page views? I just want to write about what I learned at this NetSuite con conference. Like, you know, that was just an example, but you know, surely there's, there's a readership for that. Right. And so that right. was kind of our, our goal was to try to say, there's gotta be people that care about this topic as much as we do. And those are the people we try to reach. Right. You know, what fascinates me about Diginomica, and by the way, I'm going to, um, I'm just going to pop it on the screen here so everyone can see it, but it's, in case you're not familiar with Diginomica or you don't know how to spell it, it's D-I-G-I-N-O-M-I-C-A. Um, so Diginomica.com, so you can check it out. It's a really good website, and what, what um, and I've read it, I think, the entire time you guys have been in business, just because I've known you, and I knew it, you know, I remember when you started, it doesn't seem like 10 years ago, but apparently, apparently it was, I'm going to believe you that it was 10 years ago. It doesn't feel like nearly that long. <laughs> oh ago. my goodness. But how have you, over these years then, um, this is something that has always fascinated me about you guys, is how have you stayed true to that sort of vision and that mission for what you're trying to accomplish? But at the same time, you are, you do get sponsorships and you have software tech partners and people that pay uh, for sponsorships. How do you, how do you balance that? Is that tricky? Is it, is it in conflict at times, you know, the editorial piece of it versus what the vendors want you to say? It is. And by the way, hi to all the people that are popping in from all over the, the world. That's really cool. And yeah, Tim, we are, we are a little old man, but um, <laughs> but I, I like, I like to think we're old in like an edgy and helpful way, but yeah, you can be the judge, but um, no, no, as far as, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, the good thing was that we had a lot of experience at that point. There were a lot of collective experiences in media and a lot of also failed startups that we'd all had. And so, but one of the things we had clarity on from the beginning is we were going to emphasize disclosures so that like at the end of every blog, blog post, you know, we list any, any of our clients that are related to any of the content. And as far as I know, there's still only one other publication in our industry that does that. And so our, our feeling was like that, this energy industry is very intertwined and a lot of the financial backroom dealings in this industry are really a little bit creepy. They make you want to kind of take a shower sometimes. And <laughs> it's like, it's like, wait, um, are, you know, are you a client of Gartner's like, or are you a client of Forrester's or like, like a lot of this stuff isn't very clear. And so we thought, well, we're just going to be clear about what our affiliations are and hope that the readers like say, Oh yeah, like, I, I get it. They have an affiliation there and I'll be the judge of whether that information is, is helpful or not. And, you know, and, and then of course we try to educate the vendors that are our partners that just because you're our partner doesn't mean we're not going to be critical of you at times. Um, that could be a learning curve. I'll be frank for some of our partners. They're not used to that. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately in our industry, I think there's a, a, a perception that if you're, if you're, a client of someone's that that, that you're going to just talk about how great everything is all the time and mm. and what we're trying to do is kind of challenge our industry that that's not that doesn't serve anyone's interest that doesn't help the vendor get better that doesn't help the customer understand technology and so look we're not perfect right um but that's the whole reason to disclose is 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 to kind of show here's the financial ties that we have and then you can be the judge on whether you think the content you know, is, is relevant to you or not. And so I think for the most part, readers have appreciated that transparency, even if they haven't always necessarily agreed with everything we've written. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I you're the only outlet and website that I know of that can do that. You know, that I don't, I can't think of anything that's even close in terms of being able to have that edgy balanced view of the world and realistic view of the world. But at the same time, you do have the sponsorships and that sort of thing. Um, have you ever, without mentioning names, if it's true, or if, if the answer to this is yes, have you ever lost a sponsorship or had someone say, no, I'm just not interested because if they don't like that model, they, they don't like the fact that you, yep. won't, you won't drink the Kool-Aid. Yep. Won't. Yep. Yep. We have lost, imagine. we have lost partners over this and we have probably lost the opportunity with certain vendors because of that. And, you know, that was something that we had to uh, accept, but you know, that was one of the reasons why 
we bootstrapped to Genomica. We, this is the other mistake that a lot of me, smaller media properties have made is to take venture money and then they run out of runway. And so we bootstrapped it and that gave us the ability to say, you know what, we don't need to be partners with every firm in this industry to be successful. And that remains the case. And, but, but the good news, and we can kind of get into this a little bit if you want, but I just published this, this larger piece on reaching informed buyers. But the bottom line is that, that while buyers aren't perfectly informed, it, when, when I compare buyers now to the buyers in the 90s, the buyers now are much more savvy. They, their, their BS detectors are much sharper. Mm. Um, and and that's, that's the effect of the online marketplace. Everything from peer reviews to listening to your show to, you know, to, to, to all this kind of stuff gives buyers more perspective um, year round, not, not if they just make it to a conference. And as a result of that, vendors need to learn how to communicate with buyers differently if they want to be relevant. And so, so yeah, vendors are willing to embrace the learning curve at times and to figure out a different way to communicate with buyers. And, you know, ultimately what we relate to in this industry, I think, is this understanding that that none of us are perfect, none of us have all the answers, but we'd all like to have more successful products. I mean, this is one of the biggest themes of your work is like, why do we have so many, you know, failures, you know, and, and so let's figure it out. That's kind of, that's kind of the big theme is like, let's put our heads together. Everyone has a voice in this conversation and let's figure out how to be more successful on our projects. Right. Yeah. It's, it's well said. And I think rather than burying our heads in the sand and assuming that if we just keep doing this things the way we've always done them, surely things will get better. Right. Um, yeah, I think that's the, the, the way to address it. I, I recently had a comment on, uh, one of my social media, I think it was on YouTube or something, and you might appreciate this, but I, I hadn't heard this comment. I, I have not heard this comment probably in about 10 years, but someone put a comment on uh, challenging me and it was on a failures related um, thread or topic. And the person said, uh, you're absolutely wrong. Digital transformations do not fail at a high rate. You have absolutely no evidence to prove this. And I thought, I don't mind being challenged. I get challenged all the time, but I thought, wow, that's a, that's an interesting, <laughs> that's an interesting thing to like, you know, just draw a line in the sand to say, Digital transformations do not have a, a high failure rate. So I think, you know, I think it, just being aware of the risk is, is really the key thing. And I think that's what, you know, the BS detectors and some of the other things that you guys address, I think is, is so important. We're here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise tech space. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. When things are big, that should be small. Who can tell what magic spells we are you looking to stay ahead of the curve in the ever-changing landscape of digital transformation? Then you need our newly released 2023 Digital Transformation Report. This comprehensive report covers the latest trends, technologies, and strategies to ensure your digital transformation is optimized for success. The 2023 Digital Transformation Report is packed full of proven methodologies and insights from experts in the independent digital transformation field. You'll also receive practical insights on how to implement digital transformation strategies within your unique organization. This free report is available for download on our website at thirdstage-consulting.com under our thought leadership section. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling with Kyler Cheatham, and we are here having a conversation with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise technology space. Let's jump back into it. Our comment from uh, Tim on LinkedIn, he says that you guys are old, but then he backpedals a bit and says, not old, but experienced. So thank you for that, mm -hmm. Tim. Uh, I, that's what I prefer to think. I, seasoned, veterans, uh, experienced, you know, that sounds a lot better than old. And, and Tim, thanks for the comments about transparency too. And I think that honestly applies to all of us. So, yeah. So we yeah. gotta, we gotta keep, we gotta keep working on it. It's not something that you wake up in the morning and it's sorted. You have to re recommit to that every day. Yeah, absolutely. And Tim says, I like the transparency on diginomica.com. It's a breath of fresh air, hard to find elsewhere. It's a great comment there. Um, so I guess just to start then, and you started to talk about one maybe potential answer to this question when you were talking about the the, high, the higher refined BS detectors that people seem to have or the buyers seem to have nowadays. How else would you describe, you know, your general perception of sort of the state of the union 
of the enterprise tech space right now. You, you've been covering this for well beyond the 10 years, by the way. I mean, as you mentioned, you started doing this back in the 90s. But so what have you seen over the last, I don't want to say what have you seen over the last 25 years, but but mm. how, how are things now versus how they were in the past? I mean, what's the good, the bad, the ugly? Gosh, it's 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 such a it's such a mixed bag. I mean, I think I already I already touched on I think one of the positives around the opportunity for us to be more networked and be smarter. And I, I, I talk about that in the context of like networks of trust, I guess you could call it. Um, those are so important. And unfortunately, I think we're also contending with a lot of difficulties in the form of so much technology hype, especially around AI that threatens to really muddy the conversation of how to be successful as a company. And on, on the one hand, I guess that's good for us because we can spend a lot of time on Dynamica trying to get to the bottom of that. I mean, what, one thing that I think is sort of interesting is that while technology is far from perfect, it, it is much better than it was. And, and I think the interesting thing about that is, is that it really then highlights the people and pr process and business model issues that are that are messed up and that need to be fixed because it's a lot harder to blame the technology than it was even 10 years ago. Now, look, you can still select the wrong stuff. You can configure it wrong. You can have, you know, and it's a big theme of your site is helping to understand <laughs> the decision process and the importance of it. So you can still go down that road the wrong way. But generally, if you pick the right partner which is also really important <laughs> and and you pick the right software there's a lot you can do i mean I, I i talk in terms of this notion of continuous everything like that that the whole point of enterprise software i think ultimately is to have deeper continuous visibility into all of our operations and projects so you could take that in almost any area like in hr for example performance reviews like like instead of once a year you sit down with someone by then it's probably too late to address the reasons why they're leaving your company or why they've had a falling out with their boss like like you want to have that more regular loop and and in every part in, of the industry there's something like that in manufacturing it's machines and you don't want your machines to go down you want to predict that you know, and, and so I think the technology to achieve these things has never been better. So that part is the good part. The bad part is that it was never a technology problem in the first place. It was a people yeah. problem. It was a process problem. It was a change problem, as you've described so many times. And, and, and so in a way, it almost sort of brings that more into focus that, that we got to solve these other things. And then, like I said, there's a whole different conversation around around AI and just what I consider to be absolutely insanely heightened expectations around what AI can deliver that I think are really out of whack, especially when you look at the state of data and the health of data in most uh, large enterprises. They're, they're not ready to, even if the AI tools are super wonderful, amazing, their data is not ready. Right. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I want to come back to the AI uh, comment too. I know you've got some some pretty strong thoughts on generative AI and, and uh, the, the pros and cons of that. But um, before I come back to that, though, um, one thing I wanted to ask you, too, is you, you alluded to all these changes in the technology space and how you know things have changed so fast and, and so much for the better in many ways. But to your point, it was never about the technology. It's always been about the people and process. Why, why is it that we're changing? If you look at the three layers here, people, process, technology, technology is moving at a breakneck speed. It's constantly getting better and improving and providing more capabilities. Why is that moving so much faster than people and process abilities to change? Why, why do you think that is? I don't know. Uh, pe people are um, pe people struggle with change. You know, people struggle fundamentally with change, and it, ha it has always been. Um, you know, with, with software, there's just been so much acceleration in terms of things like cloud sensibilities, DevOps sensibilities, um, APIs. This notion that that software needs to be able to play nicer with its peers so that, you know, and of course, there are problems with that, too. You can wind up with very heterogeneous landscapes that are difficult to manage, which I think you have written about at, at times. Um, and cloud software is not always as mature as it should be in certain ways. But the the model is just so, so much better because um, it's it's about reducing technical debt that prevents you from from moving fast and, and part of it is just the way the world is right now like 
like the the circumstances behind political events, behind supply chain disruptions. You just cannot afford to be be slow to respond to those things. And and I think that's put a lot of pressure on 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 the technology vendors to to get to get these things sorted. But at the same time, um, I don't know. Like it, it's just that like change is so complicated and like and you know when when you're really good at using a certain set of tools it it's understandable why you wouldn't want to just put those tools aside for other stuff and it's it's not necessarily in the interest of the employee to embrace what the overall business strategy is and i think that's where a lot of the tension comes in is like let's face it a lot of businesses don't really look after their employees in such a way that would make them want to invest in the broader change they just mm-hmm. don't they don't give them a sense that there's enough opportunity there to do that so yeah yeah, and I guess a an or or a uh, an organization is a lot like an or, an organism. You know, it's it's a uh, something that slowly evolves and morphs and changes over time, and it and it grows and it gets built, and and then that's happening over years and decades or whatever. And then over here, you've got technology, and I can create technology to do all kinds of things a lot faster than that organization took to get to wherever it is. And then those two worlds collide, and it ends up creating sort of a, a an explosion in, in many ways, you know, or at least some sort of fireworks and conflict along the way yeah and, and and throw in all the throw into the mix all the mergers and acquisitions i mean you know <clears throat> you know yourself how disruptive that can be from a systems and change standpoint so even if you think you've got a lot figured out now you've been acquired or you're acquiring somebody they have a different technical landscape than you it's pretty obvious to see where the problems are going to be there right yeah absolutely yeah um so you mentioned here um, you, you started to talk about AI a moment ago. And there's two two things I wanted to cover here. One is, uh, you know, I guess getting back to Diginomica for a second. You you talk about or you've, you've shared with me that you have a no generative AI in our writing policy. Tell us about that. Why is that? You're not so. In other words, you're not using AI at all to write your content. Is that correct? Not we're not using generative AI to write copy, and we've said we're not going to do it, and we don't plan to do it, and we're basically we said we're never going to do it i mean uh, i mean i guess there's a statute of limitations five ten years from now or whatever but right we just we just felt this was paramount to to reader trust to tell readers that the robots aren't writing the copy that you read on this website and um part of that is is a response to the the way that people are going to use that type of content to do seo gaming and you know and and try to create like fake pages and stuff and we just wanted to say these are real humans writing real stuff um, and it wasn't necessarily to say that that you should never use generative AI, generative AI for content. I mean, I see a lot of use cases, for example, in, in in marketing and different things where some of that may be actually useful as a starting point and stuff like that. Um, and there are people that actually have challenges writing where I think staring at a blank page can be intimidating. And there's examples, I think, where it can help with that, too. But we're writers, so we, we have to get over that. <laughs> and. Right. Um, and and we did make the point that we still are we still encourage our writers to use such tools in various capacities. I mean, I use Grammarly, I use uh, Otter for machine transcripts. So it's not like I, there's there's already an AI enablement of the process going on. But we just wanted to really put a stake in the ground for for reader trust and 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 for readers to know that humans are writing this content. And it wasn't necessarily judging other people as much as saying, look, this isn't happening here. And um, and, you know, it was interesting because at the time I couldn't find anyone that, that had made a similar statement. And then uh, I think of, about a month later, the Financial Times did. So I felt like that was pretty good company. And uh, I, I, I don't think they followed our lead or anything like that. They, um, and, and there'll probably be a couple other publications that do it. But it's interesting because media is such a threatened um, entity from the industry standpoint that I think media is very cautious about they don't want to overstep and say we're not going to use this and then later come back and say we did. So, but anyway, we made yeah. a commitment to it. Interesting. So, so um, that, that sort of explains, which is a really interesting stance, by the way, as it relates to generative AI and, and the lack of use of it um, intentionally for Diginomica. Um, but what about when it comes to some of the buyers that read your publication and that you interact with day to day and they're really hyped and amped about AI? You talked earlier about how there's so mm-hmm. much. Um, hype around AI and so much excitement around it, which is great. You know, it's a great, I mean, I'm excited about it. I, I imagine you might be a little bit excited about it too, but you always temper that enthusiasm with sort of the, the dose of reality. 
what is that dose of reality and sort of what are you seeing as it relates to AI and, and enterprise buyers? Well, it was interesting because one of the things that became a little bit controversial about that statement is I think we then had to explain a little further that we actually are enthusiastic about some of these use cases. And, you know, one of the interesting things about generative AI is how many different use cases it has across different industries and scenarios. And, and, and we do, we do find those interesting. And, and even from an image creation standpoint, we haven't ruled it out for, for our site. Look, I mean, we use stock photos. These are not the most incredible photos in the world. I, I, I would not be rule out that we would use that for imaging in the future. Um, but, but so, so I think there's a few different things with, with AI. I think we have to be a little bit careful because from an enterprise standpoint, there's a lot of issues around, uh, the, the flaws in these tools around things like explainability, data privacy. Uh, if you do, let, there's IP lawsuits going on right now. I think the, the tools aren't really ready for enterprise use cases yet for the most part. And that's going to play out over the next year or so. So one cautionary point is that the tools aren't ready, quite ready yet. And so um, I worry a little bit that as a result of that, we're going to obscure other things. Like, so for example, at a recent show, it took me a while to get with a customer. I'm talking with them. And it turns out that they have this pretty amazing robotics that are doing some really cool stuff on their shop floor and really and have helped them close their talent gap because they had all these open positions. And this is a classic manufacturing problem is just can't find enough talent. And, and I was like, why wasn't this robotics thing on the keynote stage? And it's like, well, because it's, it's suddenly robotics isn't like sexy anymore. I'm like, what kind of world are we living in where we're obscuring these really fundamentally important things that customers are doing that are actually like more mature and ready. So I think we have to be a little mindful of that. Like, and then, and then from a precision standpoint, we just really have to understand that these tools are massively overhyped. And while they're good at certain things, the, the generative AI emerges from a very specific kind of deep learning that I've been studying quite intensely. And it actually doesn't understand what it's saying. And it's really, really important to know that because that, that requires a lot of thinking around human in the loop scenarios and making sure that that um, you know, for example, maybe ninety percent accuracy in certain scenarios is good enough for you because mm -hmm. because you're going to take that copy and then fix it. Or there's other scenarios where okay, we're going to train only on this particular data set and then we're going to generate job descriptions, for example, which is one interesting scenario. So it requires a lot more precision, and that's in general like what the light bulbs that have gone off for me looking ahead to the next 10 years of Diginomica is that I want us to really try to be incredibly precise on Diginomica about what technology can and cannot do because vendors are terrible about saying what things can't do. They want right. to make you think that everything is possible, and this you can do this, and oh, well, you can't do that right now, but when we expand the parameters and the training sets, then we will be able to do these. It's like it's untapped, and it's like, well, actually, no, it's not untapped. It's It actually is a flaw with this form of AI, and it's that's not going to get fixed. But on the other hand, problems like things like explainability, in other words, like where, where did the AI come up with this answer, um, those things can get solved. And so I think there's some really good opportunity there. So let's just be a lot more precise in our conversation. Why should we be precise? Because we want to have more successful projects. And that's sort of the connection that I make between why I'm grouchy about this stuff versus <laughs> what I really want, which is I want to write about successful projects, not crappy projects. I'll leave yeah. the crappy projects to you, man. I don't want to talk about it either, to be honest, or, or write about it. But I'd rather be talking about the successes and, and how great everything is and um, really be searching hard for those little nooks and crannies of failure. But unfortunately, organizations tend to tend to make those, you know, a lot of the same mistakes. And I think you're right. It, it does. A lot of this does come back to the industry. I think we have the industry ourselves, you know, our, we have ourselves to blame for that. I mean, you, even though I know you and I are sort of running counter to the the mainstream of the industry, but this industry creates that mismanaged expectation and it creates that those blind spots. And I think the industry should really take a look, a long, hard look at themselves and say, in long term, is this really the right way for us to be, you know, to grow our businesses and to make the, you know, technical landscape more successful. And I, I would, I would challenge, or I would argue that that's not the way we're doing things now is not, is not the best way for sure. We're here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise tech space. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. Just 
you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos and other best practices at thirdstageconsulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling with Kyler Cheatham, and we are here having a conversation with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise technology space. Let's jump back into it. Let's see, one for, one that kind of ties to a comment you made before this discussion. So I'm going to pull this question from Laik. I don't know if I can pull the whole thing on here. Um, I'll start it, and then I'll probably have to hide it. But it says, I've Laik on LinkedIn says, I, I use proofreading and grammar correction for that purpose but I completely understand your point. It can be frustrating to come across a lot of content written by content writers and generated by robots flooding the internet on all platforms. Um, how do we address this issue? And, and maybe I'll add another part of it is how do you address this whole potential for sort of fake news and, and the, you know, in, in many ways, the, the enterprise technology vendors could potentially use AI to further perpetuate this, this echo chamber of, Un inaccurate information, incomplete information, I guess you'd say, you know, in other words, highlighting the strengths and how great things are versus mm -hmm. here's the reality and here's the risk and here's the blind spot. So how do we, how do we navigate yeah. that knowing that we have tools in place now that could maybe make things even worse for some of those dynamics we're worried about? Right. And I've written in Digenomica about whether the enterprise has a fake news problem and, and you can do a search for that and see a couple of my past articles and I'll, I'll write about it again. Um, it's a really important question and, and, and a really good distinction in that comment between AI-enabled tools that help us write better versus stuff that actually generates copy, which is, is deeply flawed at this point, um, but, but can be useful for certain things. Um, it's just like, you know, the, the bottom line is that we need, in our industry, we need human experts to have successful projects, and we need the voices of those experts in order to do that. And, you know, so... So there's two different things here because I study this the role of AI and disinformation. And disinformation was not started by AI. And there's a lot of quote-unquote disinformation in the enterprise software market already before AI generated content in the form of a lot of propaganda from technology firms that, that isn't necessarily you know, accurate in terms of what it's going to be like on your project. So on the cultural side, I'm very concerned about disinformation, and I think that we have reason to be, um, but that's sort of a separate conversation from today. On the enterprise side, I am concerned about it, but the one thing that, that gives me a little bit of hope is that if, if you buy into bad information generated by, I don't care whether it's AI or whether it's bad vendor marketing copy written by a human, because let's face it, some of that content is pretty bad also. Right. If you if you fall for that stuff, you are going to have an unsuccessful project. You're going to make bad decisions, and you're going to fail. And that's going to hurt your project, and it's going to hurt your career. So my hope for our industry, Eric, is that we have to overcome this to be successful, and that gives us motivation to get a handle on these problems. How are we going to do that? Well, it's going to be a variety of things. It's going to be self-education. It's going to be talking to your peers. It's going to be, like I said, honing that BS detector, finding trusted sources of information. Hopefully you would consider us one. We'll see. Um, yep. Folks like what you're doing, um, you know, surrounding yourself with people who have different informed views that make you think. Um, that's what it's all about. And, and, and that's one thing that really gives me hope for our industry is that there is still a respect for expertise and experience and, and trying to get a handle on that. At the same time, I think our industry battles with problems around inclusion and diversity that are very concerning and very deep as well, and we have to tackle those. So don't get me wrong. Those are important. 
but I don't have a lot of faith in AI to solve that particular diversity problem. In fact, a lot of these training sets are not very diversely sourced or trained. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. Um, and what about, um, you know, there's a comment here from, um, Tim on LinkedIn and he, he makes a comment here about AI that he, he says, I'd like to point out that many U S companies are still manually entering AP invoices into their ERP. Lowering that percentage with AI would be more amazing to me than any new AI use cases. It's such a basic application of AI, but it's still such a green territory in terms of adoption. So sort of like, you know, with, with all the potential and all these different ways we could be using AI, um, it seems as though organizations aren't yet fully, they're not even mature yet in some of the real basic fundamental uses of AI and machine learning within that. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, hundred percent. And, and, you know, Tim plays exactly to the point I was making earlier about how we let the next generation of technology obscure what's possible now. And I've been doing a series on automation vendors. I have another one coming up, an interview with Rob Enslin, uh, the co-CEO of UiPath. And we didn't talk that much about quote unquote AI, but we talked a lot about automating workflows. And, and, and you know, the, the really cool thing that that kind of does make me a little optimistic in the 10 year window. I'm not going to speak to what could happen eventually with, with machines and intelligence, but in the 10 year window, the reason I'm optimistic is because human talent is so hard to find right now that we need all the automation we can get. And at Tim's point, a lot of that automation technology is already there and there's a lot of broken and manual processes that deeply need to be addressed. And so that's the kind of work that companies should be doing right now along with what I've described earlier that someone had a question about as far as getting your data platform together. But some of that stuff seems like, oh, that's not very sexy. Well, I don't know, man. If you're stuck doing manual invoice entry all day, like getting that off your plate is pretty damn sexy. Like yeah. especially especially if you're if you know your employer has a better role in mind for you. And that's the thing we have to be really careful about with this stuff because it can be used as a headcount reduction exercise. And what I'm really hoping is that the smarter companies are going to prove that that's a stupid, arrogant, and self-defeating way to do business. And the better way is to free up your people to do more high-value tasks. And that's what I'm hoping the role of automation will be. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you know, back to your point earlier about how the problem has never been with the technology. You know, you look at all these possibilities and how fast the use cases for AI are accelerating – but yet, to Tim's point, there's just some really basic fundamental ways and low-hanging fruits you could be deploying now to, to leverage it without having to boil the ocean. You know, I think a lot of organizations get overwhelmed by the thought of AI right now. But to Tim's point, you don't need to take on you know, AI across the entire enterprise. You could start with something as simple as AP processing, something exactly. that yeah, maybe, it's, maybe it is or isn't sexy. We could argue that all day, I suppose. But it does add value. It, it delivers an ROI uh, potentially. Preach, to Tim. Preach. You, you nailed it. <laughs> Now, now speaking of ERP and maybe shifting away from AI potentially a little bit here, um, here's a question from Julio on LinkedIn. And Julio asked the question of, um, "What is the current? What is the? What is your opinion of the current ERP ecosystem as of today? And how does it contrast with ten years ago? And how do you think it will evolve in the next ten years?" So, just looking at the ERP <laughs> software space, um, what? How, how are wow. things different today? And where is it headed? What are your thoughts there? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I think. I think if you look at ERP vendors now, they're all emphasizing like a more modern platform and modern approach. And I think mostly that's a good thing because, you know, the 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 ERP of the past was all based on helping companies do a lot of customization of their code base in ways that trap them on older releases. And Eric, you and I could have a really interesting debate. Unfortunately, I don't think we have time to do a full one today on when to customize and when not to. But in general, I'm going to make the argument that that was a bad exercise enabled by greedy systems integrators that took mm. all the work that they could get from that without ever really thinking about where this would all end up. And fortunately now, that's changing. And even like a... Even companies that offer on-premise ERP, for example, in asset-intensive industries and stuff like that where there's a lot of regulations, are still talking to their customers around the dangers of over-customizing their code base. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the whole idea behind that is we need to be more, quote-unquote, agile going forward than we have been in the past. But in general, 
I think what we're going to see is transactional systems of record are going to become a commodity. That's not the key. And you're already seeing it. It's already a trend that's happening. The whole thing is like, how do I pull meaningful data out of these systems to make better decisions, to serve customers better? To We have to, ERP was very inward focused. We have to look much more externally now, connecting to supplier networks. Like, like sometimes now we're accountable for what our second tier suppliers do, not even our first tier, but our second tier in certain regulatory environments in Europe, for example. We need different software for that purpose. And I think that's really pushing ERP vendors and maybe we'll even make room for some upstart players in some cases. Now we have a long way to go here, but the one thing I will say is I think the service industry needs to evolve because I think the software industry has evolved better than the service industry. And the service industry is still operating mostly on legacy playbooks. And I'd like to see a lot more differentiation around helping customers with true advisory, pushing back and not just saying, oh, the customer's always right. We're gonna build a bunch of customizations for the customer, pushing back and say, here's how we're gonna win going forward. And here's, here's how we're going to keep your platform modern. Oh, and by the way, like more independent voices, which is like a big thing that I advocate, which is why are we so dependent on one firm to lead us down a particular path of services? Like why, why don't we have more independents in there who can come and do various audits and gut checks on projects? And no, Eric didn't ask me to say this <laughs> uh, because Eric does do this work, but I've, I've studied this from multiple angles and the best projects have more independent voices at the table and not just one prime vendor. And and so I, I like to think that the industry is evolving away a little bit from that. But let's be honest, like this isn't going to change overnight. Right. And as long as the economic incentives are still there for you to potentially do something that conflicts with clients' best interests, that's always going to be a challenge. I mean, I don't know how you fix that. I don't know if it'll ever get regulated or whatever. But to your point, like with customization, yeah, I mean, if I'm a software vendor, I could tell you all day, like, yeah, don't customize. But in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, well, although it will help me if you if you customize, that's going to add three months to this project and another half million right. dollars of billable revenue or whatever. You know, you can't help but think that we're all human, right? So I think Absolutely. that's the tricky part of this. Yeah, you have to redo your business model. But there's a lot of SaaS consulting firms that serve SaaS vendors that have figured out that renewals and subscriptions are a pretty nice business model also. Yeah. And, and you and, and ideally what that means is you're earning the business every year by proving you're still relevant and successful. So I, li I like that model so much better. You can debate whether multi-tenant cloud, maybe that's not good for everything. But the point is that model of staying invested in a customer's success year after year is so much better than, oh, the old days of like, high fives, we took your ERP project live, now let's go walk away and like on to the next project and good luck with your ERP and like trying to compete in 21st <laughs> century business. Yeah, that's gonna work, that's gonna work great. Um, right. But I think one interesting thing going forward, if you look ahead 10 years, if indeed we do realize some of the potential of AI, like so for example, I talked with a partner at IBM who's a friend of mine who says, I don't really go into my HR system anymore because IBM's got some pretty advanced generative stuff based on how Watson's evolved. He says, you know, I just told my, my HR, like provision this employee and it goes and provisions this employee. And, and so that's still limited, but imagine that like in a lot of scenarios in enterprise software, right? Where you're like, hey, can you configure this product in this region? Or can you tell me if I need to shift uh, workloads to this different facility, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think that's really interesting because I think now we're starting to get away from product categories because I'm not in my ERP system anymore. I'm not in my CRM system anymore. I'm just asking my system to do shit for me. <laughs> and right. I don't want to hear, for example, about licenses. I don't want to hear, well, sorry, I can't answer that question because you don't have the right product license for this. Um, and personally, I think a lot of this stuff's really refreshing because I don't know about you, but I get the, the magic quadrants and Forrester waves and all this stuff, tracking all these product categories and stuff. I don't really think that's where customers' heads are at anymore. I, I understand why you need to do that to a point, but there's a point at which it's like, I'm just trying to solve business problems. I don't care what product category I'm using. And so if I look ahead five, 10 years, I look at the erosion of, of product categories like ERP and supply chain and CRM. And I look at a focus on workflows, automation, solving problems, making it easy, easy for me to interact with these systems and just focus on the customer, focus on getting the job done. Right. Now, do you think, I, and this is a, I apologize if this is a hard question for you to ask because I may be picking on one or more of your your uh, advertisers and sponsors a bit, but do you think 10, 10 years from now, do you think we'll have the same big 
ERP vendors sort of like dominating the market with SAP, Oracle, Microsoft, uh, Oracle NetSuite, you know, do you think it'll be the same, the same players or do you think that it's going to look totally different in 10 years from now in terms of who the leaders are in the space? Well, like I said, I think the transactional layer is going to recede in importance and become a commodity and that's going to threaten a number of these vendors. Some of them are going to reinvent and and survive the transition there's still a big advantage to being a big software company right now when you look at the importance of data for example in the new scenarios having all that data having that huge footprint and and customers are inherently a little conservative it's going to take a long time to play out but i think you're going to see some of these players not going to go away but they're going to have a perceived they're going to be less and less perceived as as totally relevant like they're going to be perceived more and more like, ah, oh, yeah, we run that, but that's not who we go to when we want to talk about what's next for our business and transformation. So, you know, you see how this happens in our industry where at one point IBM was considered cutting edge. And now, obviously, it's trying to reinvent, but the point is it's not the first firm out of your lips when you think what's the most cutting edge firm in software today, right? right. Um, so so firms have a way of sticking around, but, but maybe they lose a little bit of a cachet of being a front line. Um, we have to keep a close eye on the hyperscalers, like because the the Amazons, the Googles, and and the Microsofts. I think they're going to have a lot to say about the future of this industry because of the power of those infrastructure models. And I'm not hmm. sure that's necessarily a a good thing because I don't think this is going to be a real startup friendly industry in a lot of ways. But I we I think we'll probably see a few vendors like like the Workdays that emerged into prominence. I think we'll see a few like that, but it's actually not going to be too easy because the the these AI models are all about data volume and 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 running at massive scale. And I think that makes it difficult for startups. Yeah, that's really well said and great points on the the hyperscaling and the importance of data. Um, that in fact, that was one of our questions from uh, Kyler on LinkedIn had a question too about about that. We're here with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise tech space. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. Interested in working for a company that truly values your unique skills and experience? Here at Third Stage, we don't hire based on resumes alone. We look at the full candidate experience and willingness to provide excellent service for our clients. Within a technology independent and agnostic consulting firm, you have the opportunity to learn across industries with a diverse group of clients. Our consultants also have the opportunity to diversify their portfolio and learn across technology systems. If you're interested in joining a high growth entrepreneurial organization, please reach out to us at work at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling with Tyler Cheatham, and we are here having a conversation with John Reed from Diginomica talking about trends in the enterprise technology space. Let's jump back into it. And I wanted to get to, um, you know, one of the comments, you, you and I were exchanging an e email thread about preparing for this uh, this uh, discussion. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read one comment in your, in your uh, email verbatim because I feel like you said it better than I can paraphrase it. But you said in here, um, you know, one of your suggestions was to discuss why you're, you're increasingly agitated about buzzword overuse and your push for precision and clarity and why that's so important to buyers. And that's one thing I think you and I really connected early on in our, you know, uh, running in parallel universes here early on in our, you know, back in the early 2000s, it was, was our, both of our distaste for buzzwords. I think that was something that you and I have shared pre pretty uh, strongly and were pretty well aligned on that. But what, tell us what you mean by that. Why, why do buzzwords agitate you and how can vendors be more clear in their marketing and their messaging to the, to the market? I'll keep the answer fairly short because I think we've covered some of this, but I think vendors are, like I said, vendors are really bad at saying what something doesn't do. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's what customers really need to hear in order to understand what something does do. You have to understand what it can't do. And vendors really don't like to talk about that. So you and I need to. Right. Um, and, and, and in general, um, you know, most of the buzzwords in our industry actually do have some some relevance. It's just that they require so much more precision in order to understand. And what I came to understand is that making fun of buzzwords is healthy because 
you know, whether it's blockchain or low code or whatever, because then we can scratch underneath it and figure out like, okay, first of all, is low code really new? Well, not really. We've had rapid, rapid application de development environments for 20 years. Mm. So what is new about this? And one of the best ones was a couple of my friends, VJ, VJ Sanka, or Ernesto Bonkolsky, years ago, they got into a debate about change management versus digital transformation. And long story short, Esteban got really insulted because VJ was saying that change management and digital transformation were the same thing. And Esteban was like, no, they absolutely are not. And they had this big argument about that. But, but I think it was a really, really healthy discussion because that is an important point, right? Like we mm -hmm. need to understand, like, and I actually think they are different, but like, like you've been writing a lot about digital transformation and reading lately and like the failures and some really good blogs. And, and, and one of the things that I was like, you know, if Eric and I had an hour, it'd be really fun to really pick apart what digital transformation means and what, what does failure in a digital transformation context mean? Because this is all really important because a lot of times I think what you refer to as digital transformation failure, I would refer to as ERP project failure. I would say that that actually wasn't a genuine transformation to begin with. That was an ERP project dressed up in transformation language. And so I always want to really encourage companies to take a broader look at transformation and, and to do it outside the context of software choices, but, but to look more at where's our industry going, where's our business going, where are our customers going, how are we going to be able to be competitive 5, 10, 15 years out and, and not have a product conversation at that point. And, and I think if you do that, I think it's really hard to fail, actually, because even if you stumble, you're having the right collective conversation. But the problem is that so often they just attach digital transformation to a software implementation. And that I have a huge problem with. And I'm not surprised those underperform and fail. Anyway, right. that's just yeah. one example. But we, we could do that with almost any term in our industry and have a great discussion. We could sure as hell do it with blockchain and stuff like that. But the one thing I would say is the big difference between blockchain, Web3, Metaverse, and AI is that AI is surging on the backs of massive consumer adoption. And that's why we have to talk about it because it's here. It's real. A lot of employees are using these tools improperly. <laughs> Shadow AI, we call it. But when 90% of your developers and 90% of your marketers are playing around with these tools, you better hone in on this problem. So that's why we're talking about it so much. Yeah, absolutely. That you, you just gave me a great idea that maybe you could be a guest on in, in this discussion, which is sort of battle of the buzzwords. You know, let's unpack each of these uh, best yeah, practices. Exactly. Uh, you know, you mentioned uh, you mentioned low code best practices, um, uh, even cloud. You look at the word cloud. I mean, that's sort of a buzzword. It's it's highly effective, but it, it's not new. I mean, you had ASP right. back twenty five years ago. But ASP doesn't sound nearly as good as cloud. So cloud is just and a it's much really better. not a cloud, right? It's in someone's data center somewhere, right? Right, right. So, exactly. You know, you could have a lot of discussions around that, and and I think uh, discussing what true SaaS characteristics are is a really interesting discussion. Also, in terms of what are the true advantages of the, those economies of scale and why do they matter? But you know, those are examples that you could literally spend an hour on each of those topics, and they could be very informative. You know, yeah. so that's that's what I'm trying to do is turn that mischief and my irritation into that into a way to to have better products and better results. So that's how I made the connection. Yeah, and it's a great point that it's it's worth having these conversations of, you know, I'll pick on best practices. You know, let's talk about best practices. Are they really best practices? Not because I want to be a naysayer and, and just totally go against what the rest of the industry is saying, but because you have to understand what that really means. What do best practices really mean? And what are the pros and the cons of that? And, you know, if we sit here and just focus on totally. just the great things, it's it's not going to be healthy for any of us if all we do is focus on the good side of it versus the downside risk of what, what we're going up against. Yeah, actually, one very quick aside. About 10 years ago, before my uh, Diginomica colleague, Dan Hallett, retired, he went on a rant about best practices and said there are no best practices. I thought about it, and I decided never to use best practices in my writing again, and I haven't used it in 10 years since, since yeah. I went on that rant. And it's not, that the, it's, it's not that that word never has use, but I just decided not to use it because I was like, it's the kind of word that makes you more comfortable after you use it. Like you just said something useful and I'm not sure it's useful. Right. So I, I, I think it may be, it may be more useful to say that every company needs to examine existing methodologies and, and find the best one for them. You know? Right. But I don't yeah. know. It's a word I, I do occasionally still use it, but every time I do, I cringe a little bit and I do yeah. feel dirty. Like I need to take a shower. Like you were saying earlier, it's every time I use the word best practice, but, but I agree. Yeah. I think it's, it's worth diving into and, and really asking the questions and the tough questions and, and turning to the independent, independent voices like Diginomica, like third stage and others out there 
Um, and I think in overtime, I think there'll be more and more independent voices. It's certainly more, it seems like there's more into point independent voices now than there were 10 or 20 years ago. What, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, in, in some ways, yes. I mean, I'm what I'm what I, I, I think there there's been a rise of so many people with their own voices in this industry, which I think is really welcome. Um, I think that it's a longer conversation, but I think the analyst side of our industry still could could use a lot more upstarts. And yeah. and you know, we we try to reinvent media. I'd be interested now in trying to reinvent the analyst game a little bit. That's a longer conversation, also. Um, cause I spent a lot of time with analysts and th- I see a lot of problems with, with how those business models are conducted right now in the, in terms of customers, best interest, but, um, but, um, the, the one thing I am a little bit worried about and, and I'm worried about this from a consumer, uh, citizen standpoint, as well as an enterprise standpoint is the degree to which AI enabled search stuff that's coming out around generative stuff is going to hurt the visibility of people like, like you and me and hurt the more outside voices because, what, what this sort of inline search is all about is saying uh, that Google or whoever, wherever you're searching has the answers. And, and those answers are going to be encapsulated in this like smaller thing. It's less about linking out to experts. And I really worry about the future of our industry when expert voices are obscured. And, and it, it feels like the big danger going forward is to revert back to a handful of voices that control the conversation. And unwittingly, I think these AI tools could lead us back into that. Now, there are some really good ways of combating that. And I think, for example, building our own networks is a big part of that. And building, in, in my book on reaching the informed buyer, which, by the way, is free on Diginomica if you want to read it. Or you can just read the blogs for free, too, if you don't want to sign up for it. But I talk about these different models, and the model that I embrace is the model of the opt-in community. And that's kind of what you're building around your business. And so that provides you some protection against some of these AI machinations because people subscribe to you, and at least now you have a direct pipeline into those people going forward. Um, And so to me, companies and, and our industry as a whole runs a real risk there of overlooking that machines actually aren't aren't going to necessarily going to refer us to outside experts because they want to pretend like they're the experts when they're interacting with us. But in fact, they've been trained on expert content. They've been trained on your site. They've been trained on my site and they're actually appropriating our expertise, but they don't know what they're saying. That's a big problem. So I'm worried about that, but I also really like the fact that we can build our own platforms and have, you know, we're having this great conversation today with all this excellent chat without any adult supervision in the room, you know? Right. So, so that's great. And I think that's good for the people in the audience who have been fantastic during this conversation, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, that's really well said. And uh, what, what is it that, you know, looking at sort of how the, the industry has evolved and changed and where it's he- it headed in the future and all the things that are to be excited about and also things that there, it is important to be cautious of what, what sort of closing advice would you have for enterprise tech buyers that are, launching an ERP implementation and or some sort of digital transformation. Yeah, I actually made made a list of those and so I'm going to I'm going to refresh my memory here cuz I think this was um interesting. And while you're pulling that up by the way, I, I shared your uh, link to your ebook in the chat. Oh, here, thank so, you. Um so be sure to check yeah, it out. Yeah. Here. Yeah, and if you, like I said if you don't want to do the sign up form, you can there's a lot of blog posts because this was ultimately based on a bunch of blogs I did. Um, so, so my closing advice, and again, Eric, Eric had no influence on this. Um, my closing advice is um, keep your BS detectors sharp. Um, come up for air more often. Um, I, I find that the customers having the most success are always interacting. They're interacting with their peers. Um, they're forming so-called trust networks uh, of diverse voices, including especially other customers, but also you know, anyone that, that has good insights, they're, they're, they're consuming that all the time. Um, the, when you get two heads down on your projects, you're not going to get as good a result as if you have more of a habit of coming up for error and getting gut checks. Most of the projects that Eric writes about that, that, that fall apart, there were multiple opportunities along the way to correct those before they reach that point. And so finding a way to come up for error is big. Another really big one is... I call it I call it buzzword boomerang, but churning the buzzwords back onto the vendors and customer success <laughs> is my favorite because every vendor is pushing customer success right now. So take them up on that and and say let's have a customer success conversation about how my product is going to be successful. Mm-hmm. And it's all about 
measuring the right KPIs. And both those things are important. You have to measure stuff, but it's got to be the right stuff. And everyone involved with your projects, ha to some extent, has to agree on what those metrics are going to be. That's not an easy thing because service providers and SIs have their own set of criteria. It can be hard to get everyone on the same page. But if, if vendors are going to push this customer success conversation, I say take it, appropriate it, and push it back on them with your definition of success and see if you can agree to that. And if you can't, then why would you go forward with such a project under those circumstances? Right. But if you but if you could and you could have someone like yourself sitting there, if you could have a customer sitting there, a partner sitting there, vendor, everyone agrees on what the success criteria are going to be and how you're going to measure and track them. I really like where that goes. And I would like to see vendors, by the way, devote a lot more technology to project monitoring the same amount that they devote to other stuff. But that's a whole different conversation. So, yeah. And 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 again, just be careful with tech hype, especially around generative AI in particular. Um, and don't use tools like this as headcount reduction exercises. Use them to increase diversity. Like, like for example, we didn't even have this conversation. But the other thing I'm really excited about is the potential for remote work and collaboration tools to actually tap into talent that's been excluded from participating in the enterprise because they can't come into the office because they're looking after an aging relative or they're in another country or they have various commitments with their health that they can't. And, and like using that technology to tap into talent is really exciting as well. That's one of the things I'm most excited about is challenging this oppressive notion that we all have to be in the office in order to, to like to be functional corporate citizens. I think that's a really and then that's those same companies say we can't find talent. It's like, well, yeah, the talent's out there. You just don't know how to tap into it. And so I'm really wanting to encourage customers to say, let's use these tools to create talent and then people say oh well we can't do that because you know remote has all these disadvantages it's like well have you really looked at all the opportunities here for example to have collaborative work um co-working spaces close to where those people are so they can actually meet like it doesn't have to be all remote it's just like let's use these tools in a more creative way so that's my other big talking point for customers is to figure out how to do that uh, wow that's a lot that's uh now you should is, is this an article we could find on your uh <laughs> On your website. I've written a lot about I've written a lot about remote work in the past. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, so, even just yeah. this overall just this overall thread of recommendations to enterprise tech buyers in 2023 and beyond is that a, a it sounds like it could be an article. You, know, you just gave me an idea for an article, Eric, because I just wrote all these bullet points for you. And uh, yeah, so yeah, I'll turn that into an article. Why not? And uh, I it's, can source this conversation and be like, Eric inspired me to do this, and uh, and we'll do it. What was and you gave me the idea for the what'd you call it? What was the buzzword? Not buzzword bingo. Buzzword. Buzzword boomerang effect. Buzzword boomerang. That's right. Yeah, um, it's buzzword like, boomerang. Be that's careful those buzzwords; they're going to come back and smack you. So you yeah. gave me an idea for a video or a blog or both or something. There you go. Like, yeah. 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 No, I like love it. Redefine that on your own terms. Yeah, exactly. It'd be a great debate too. I like that idea. Um, well, great. Well, um, appreciate you being here today. This was a great, uh, great conversation. A lot of fun and. Uh, I would love to have you back again. And maybe the buzzword angle is, is a good way to go because we both have that shared passion or lack of <laughs> lack thereof uh, for buzzwords. Um, so thank you for being here. And uh, how can people connect with you uh, other than Diginomica? What's the best way to connect and follow your stuff? Well, LinkedIn's LinkedIn's obviously a good way. Um, you know, Diginomica is my home base. I'm also, I have also Twitter. If you like Twitter, um, I noticed there were a few questions we didn't get to. If you want to ping me on LinkedIn, I'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, we tried to get to a lot of them, but there were a lot surged at the end there. Um, so yeah, just, yeah. just find me on those platforms. Happy to continue the dialogue and, you know, this is just one session, but we'll hopefully we'll keep doing it. Maybe I'll have Eric on my show again soon and we'll take it from there. All right. Thank you, John. Appreciate all your great insights and entertaining insights as well. So thank you for being on the show. It's great to have you on again and look forward to having you on here again. Thank you to the audience for the great questions there as well. In fact, we've got some things to unpack and uncover and, and dive into from that conversation. Uh, Kyler and I will dive into that here in a moment. But first, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. If 
you are involved in any sort of digital transformation or business change initiative, you will want to download the 2021 Digital Transformation Report. With its comprehensive overview of business and technology trends and best practices, this report is a must-have guide for any transformation project or executive team. Download this free report by visiting Third Stage Consulting at thirdstage-consulting.com. You can also visit our website to learn more about us or download independent reports, videos, and other best practices. Again, visit thirdstage-consulting.com today to learn how to take your transformation to the third stage of success. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham. And you can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and audio podcast platforms throughout the world. And Kyler, we just had John Reed from Diginomica on the show. Um, interesting, entertaining guy. What were some of your thoughts from that conversation? Oh, of course. I mean, for the two of you that despise buzzwords so much, you are great at naming things. We're over here, buzzword boomerang, battle of the buzzwords, all of these different things. Um, and, you know, I, I think John is always so interesting because of the overall model of his platform because he's like, hey, you know, you can sponsor these posts, but I'm going to tell everyone you sponsor these posts. And then also I might talk bad about you <laughs> in um, – in other areas. And it's just because he's got such prowess in the marketplace and people truly do believe him because he's so authentic, he's able to do that. But it's just so fascinating to me that he was kind of able to carve out that really important niche and that ability to still be transparent while making a successful business model. So, so much to be learned from that overall, um, that overall process. And I think the the piece that I really pulled out of it is you are able to have a, a conversation around transparency in the ERP or the digital transformation space. It does exist, but that's why it's so rare is because of the power and the marketing budget of these, you know, bigger vendors to really control the messaging. Um, and I think that that's like, that's such a real thing of having the generative AI really almost amplify that. So I'm curious if, we'll be able to kind of hold this independence conversation and grow it, or if it will just be saturated with AI flooded content on the side of the vendors. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I always wonder that too, especially if it becomes a self-fulfilling or, or a snowball effect, if you will, where vendors create their highly carefully curated message, AI picks up on that and then starts building additional content based on those same inputs. And it just sort of becomes truth, if you will, because AI spits it out and AI has looked at all the different data sources and concluded that, you know, the sky is blue and, you know, everything is rainbows and unicorns and unicorns do in fact exist, that sort of thing. I mean, that that's the sort of thing I worry about is how, how do you counter that? Not just in this space, by the way, I mean, in society in general, how are you going to combat fake news and disinformation and all that stuff. And how is AI going to know the difference? Should AI or will it, does it need to know the difference? I, I guess those are all questions I don't have good answers to. Yeah. The eth ethics of AI is really complicated um, just on, on that side, but also kind of the policies in place for the guardrails around it for enterprises. And I think that's what you guys were kind of scratching the surface around of, do we embrace it? Do we just kind of go all in? Or do we you know, need to have some level of skepticism and do some upskilling for our workforce to ensure that, okay, I went on ChatGPT and I wrote a blog, but I have to read said blog and know that there needs to be some fact checking involved. That's a, a really difficult change management. And I almost wonder how you're evolving our methodology with our clients to kind of meet those needs of emerging tech and change. Because I assume it's a huge, huge area of either resistance, fear, just really complicated. Yeah, it is. It's, uh, it's difficult because the technology, it's sort of like a hockey stick, you know, as far as the rate of change with technology, it's a hockey stick acceleration of change. And, you know, but with organizations, as, as we talked about, or as I talked about John a moment ago, you know, organism or organizations are like organisms and they take years and decades to evolve and get to where they are. 
And if you want to change it or do a 180 or a hard turn on the direction you're going, it's not going to happen nearly as fast as you can change the technology. And I think that's going to become more and more true. That chasm between human and organizational ability to change and technology, that tech, that chasm is just going to continue to grow over time. So I think it's just, it's a matter of really doubling down on these things that matter so much to a transformation. They become even more important over time, which is change management, the process, business process management, and the overall program management. All that stuff becomes increasingly important as technology accelerates the pace of change. Um, so that's, I don't, I don't know that things change as far as what you do. It's just the intensity and the importance of that need mm -hmm. increases over time. Yeah. Yeah. And I assume those assessment tools or those supporting tools, like you mentioned in earlier in the episode around just those health checks to ensure that if you are implementing a new technology, that your overall culture is not only leveraging it, but okay with the perception around it. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, just to give maybe a concrete example of how technology has changed the impact to an organization, but also demonstrate how the same tools that should be used in any sort of tech initiative can capture those, those strains. One example would be AI. I mean, you look at AI and the impact it has to an organization. Yes, it can automate jobs and yes, it could eliminate jobs, but I don't think that's the biggest risk or the biggest fear that organizations and humans within organizations have. I think the bigger risk is that it's going to totally transform the way they do their jobs. Um, that in some ways is more scary than potentially losing your job. Um, and I don't think many organizations are going to use AI necessarily in the short term to eliminate jobs. They might slow back their hiring and rely less on humans over time as they grow. But in general, I don't think organizations are going to use AI to eliminate jobs. But it's fairly safe to say that AI will highly impact people's jobs in the way they do it. So that sort of fear and that impact is very different than in a lot of ways than your traditional ERP software of years past. But if you do an organizational assessment, develop a change strategy based on that organizational assessment, you're going to capture all that. It's going to look different because it's AI now and it's a new technology, but the inputs and outputs from that change process should largely follow the same process, even though it might look a little bit different how you deploy it because the technology is different. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to have a unique strategic approach for each organization, because each organization is going to have different capacity to absorb those changes. Um, and those cookie cutter approaches are just never going to work for every organization. That's a huge risk too, because if you fail once, now you have to overcome that fatigue around failure, the misperceptions of this, oh, this isn't going to work. And that's much harder to climb that mountain, you know, than, than um, really address it at first. But um, yeah, there's so many threads to that conversation. I, I feel like you and John need like a weekly series um, to go through all of the different people pieces that you covered when it comes to um, generative AI, when it comes to, I was really interested in the talent conversation of how do you, you know, staff a project? How do you, what does the modern IT um, talent look like? That is so interesting. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunity uh, to do something with him consistently. You guys should have your own show. I feel like I'm like giving away my job right now, but um, at the same time, I, I think it's great. You could be our third, our third yeah. host. Oh yeah. Just make Absolutely. him a host of the show and we just, <laughs> that'd be kind of cool. Yeah, definitely. Definitely need a, a battle of the buzzwords panel because there'll be, oh, that'd be fun. Th I can think of like three people off the top of my head that would be excellent for that. So that would be really fun. Yeah, I love that topic idea. And, and we can attribute that or credit John for that idea. John Reed, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, that's, yeah, it was good to, good to have him on the show and we'll definitely have him back and, and ask him to come back. Uh, maybe the buzzword angle will be the next time we have him. So uh, thanks again, John, for being here. And, uh, we have uh, another guest that's going to join us here in a moment, uh, a little bit different, uh, rather than someone who's late, later in their careers or mid-career like, like um, John and I, we'll have uh, Jordy McDougall, who's a uh, junior consultant here at, at Third Stage, a very smart and experienced guy, but just starting out in the world of consulting. So we want to uh, talk to him, and you, you're going to have a chance to talk to him, Kyler, about life of a junior consultant, what it's like, what it's, how, do you, how do you rise up and, and start out in this, in this space and sort of get his initial observation. So we'll have him on the show here in a moment, but first we're gonna take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. If you are aiming for transformation success, turn to Third Stage Consulting Group. 
Third Stage's independent and technology agnostic consulting team helps clients define their digital strategies, define their roadmaps, and manage their transformations. With offices in the US, Europe, and Australia, our team helps the world's most forward-thinking organizations through their transformation pitfalls and risks. If you are embarking on a digital transformation or business change initiative, contact Third Stage Consulting to see how we can help you reach the third stage of transformation success. Learn more about us and download independent reports, videos, and other best practices at thirdstage-consulting.com. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyla Cheatham. You can find new episodes of this show every Wednesday on YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and audio podcast platforms throughout the world. So shifting gears a bit here with our, our final guest, Kyler, uh, you're going to sit down with uh, Jordan McDougal to chat about life as a junior consultant and what some of the good, the bad, the ugly, or the pros and cons are, and just some of those initial observations. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Kyler. Thanks, Eric. Excited for this conversation. So Jordy, welcome, and let's get into it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. So can you introduce yourself, give us a, a little bit of background about who you are, where you're from, um, you know, your, your current, you're, I guess, a kind of a new grad still, right, from university? Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, so maybe um, just tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm relatively new uh, graduate school graduate. I uh, just finished my MBA in December of 22. And i um, originally from Canada, but uh, moved to Denver, Colorado here. And when I accepted a consulting job with Third Stage and um, yeah, I've just been loving it a lot so far. It's been a really, really exciting and fast paced uh, start to my professional career. Excellent. Well, cool. So wh what did you study in school and where did you go to school? So I went to school at Minot State University in North Dakota. Um, originally went there to, to play some athletics. I played baseball and football there. And in my undergrad, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. Um, I knew that I obviously enjoyed sports. So I, so I initially went into physical education. Mm -hmm. And as I was progressing through that undergrad degree, I, I started to kind of realize that, you know, I, that might not be my passion for a for a career, but I was uh, close enough to graduating. So I thought, you know, I'd just finish that through mm -hmm. and then, um, you know, go back to school to grad school. So I stuck around at Minot State and I actually um, was a graduate assistant in the, in the athletic department. So working with boosters and um, kind of the, the front office side of athletics, mm -hmm. which uh, was a lot different than, than, you know, playing the actual sport and being an athlete. Uh, but that was a great experience, and and from that I got a uh, master's in sports management as well as my MBA. Very cool. That's yeah. excellent. And so so sports, I think a lot of us use sports reference here when it comes to digital transformation a lot. I think there's a lot of synergies around kind of the team dynamics and what that looks like as far as strategies. But what got you into kind of the the more technical space like you are today? I think just. Um, you know, studying my MBA, getting more of uh, insight into business as a whole, it started to really, you know, pique my interest in the the technology space. And and like you said, being able to link the the teamwork and the team aspect of sports to digital transformation was a uh, was something that really uh, got caught my attention and something that uh, you know I really enjoy. And how did you kind of find the third stage um, brand? Because we kind of are a, a unique niche in the marketplace as one of the only technology agnostic and completely independent consulting firms. Yeah, it's it's uh, kind of funny. I was actually just scrolling through TikTok one day and kind of just searching, you know, supply chain or mm -hmm. business and just certain things. And I kept seeing Eric's and, uh, and third stage's <laughs> content. And, uh, you know, it was really interesting. I liked... Um, lots of the ideas and concepts that uh, Third Stage was putting out there. So I matched with Eric on LinkedIn and, and just started to um, kind of try to form a relationship or start, you know, asking him questions or sending him messages. And and one thing just kind of led to another, I guess. 
Yeah, like-minded individuals. And and that's um, definitely a way in which we find our clients too on TikTok, which is so funny. So, and yeah. if you don't, don't already follow Eric and our brand on TikTok, we do have um, 60,000 TikTok followers, which on the marketing side is just insane to us um, because it's really just become an, an organic tool of um, hosting our video content, which um, keeps us all all young, I guess, in the the TikTok realm. We don't do a lot of dances, but you know, I'm going to try and convince him to start. So <laughs> I would like to see that. Yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> so in, in looking at consulting traditionally, especially with our younger resources, it can be kind of scary to go into the consulting world because there's a lot of ambiguity. There's a lot of gray areas in which you kind of have to learn on the fly. Did you have any hesitancy or were you pretty excited about the opportunity to learn across industry verticals? Yeah, I was very excited. Um, I don't know about hesitancy, but there's almost every now and again, you might start to creep into that. Oh, like, I don't really know as much as, you know, everybody else does or that feeling of, uh, I guess some people call it imposter syndrome. But, you know, I was excited about it because uh, I, I just getting to meet all the senior resources here at Third Stage, they're very helpful and, and very intelligent and willing to uh, kind of explain some of their past experiences to me and, and to help um, improve my early career. So the resources kind of took away all the hesitancy, I would say, um, from joining the consulting industry. Okay, we're here having a conversation between Kyler and Jordy McDougall talking about life as a junior consultant. We've got a lot more to cover, but first we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Transformation Ground Control. We'll be right back. When I wake up... Well, I know I'm going to be, I'm going to be the man who wakes up next to you when I go out. Hi, this is Eric Kimberling with Third Stage Consulting and your host of Transformation Ground Control. I want to encourage you to read our Guide to Organizational Change Management. It's a free report or free guide that we published. It's one that I actually wrote that talks about best practices and lessons learned as it relates to change management. So as you know, on this podcast, we cover a lot of stuff related to the human sides of change, organizational change management, including training, communications, org design, all kinds of stuff as it relates to change management. So if you're trying to learn more about change management or you're looking for more direction and ideas on how to get started on your change management strategy and your overall journey, be sure to check out this guide. You can read it by scanning the QR code on the screen in front of you or in the links below for this particular podcast episode. You can find a link to uh, take you to the page that will allow you to register to go ahead and download that and read it for free. So be sure to check it out. It's the Guide to Organizational Change Management uh, written by yours truly. I hope you enjoy it. Let me know what you think and hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hello, welcome back to Transformation Ground Control, episode number 127. My name is Eric Kimberling here with Kyler Cheatham, and Kyler and Jordy McDougall are here chatting about life as a junior consultant. Let's jump back into the conversation. Do you know any of your other friends or networks that are consultants um, as well in the space? I do not. It's um, lots of my friends will ask me, like, what do you do? And that's kind of one of the, the funnier questions that I get because it's really hard to explain, I guess, like each day is, is totally different. I mean, obviously there's similarities, but um, yeah, I don't have, you know, friends or family that are within the industry. So uh, it's very new and exciting to me and it's something that I enjoy. That's great. That's great. Well, we're definitely um, grateful to have you for sure. So let's talk a little bit about um, kind of what work you started to work on here, um, kind of a day in the life of a junior consultant. So can you kind of take us through some top line projects that you're working on right now? Sure. So right now I have um, multiple projects. Uh, one is a food distribution company. And another one is a construction services company. So very different industries mm -hmm. that, um, you know, getting experience with. But lots of what I do is um, we'll go through process mapping workshops and kind of figure out where company's current state is and, and where they're how they're operating today. And then we'll work alongside with all the different departments within that organization to to really focus in on certain pain points that they're having or um, in ways that we can improve. So when they strive towards that future state where where they're striving towards and wanting to get to, we can start to call out certain things that uh, they'll need to have functionality in to be able to get there. So 
that's lots of uh, the day to day that I do is is communicating with different departments or, or different um, department heads and and starting to kind of map out their entire uh, roadmap. Very cool. Well, it sounds like um, a very, very exciting opportunity to kind of build some knowledge in different industries. Um, so what's a challenge that you've experienced with consulting that you maybe weren't considering or weren't aware of um, when it comes to the work that you do? I would say that some of the challenges could just be uh, being able to communicate with people from all different sorts of backgrounds and different um, technical abilities mm -hmm. and things like that. And just being able to um, really meet everyone that you're you're working with at, at their level and being able to um, just figure out the solution that they're looking for. I think um, making sure everyone's aligned, trying to uh, go the same direction is uh, really important. And then once you, you get that alignment, then it's just being able to connect and build relationships with, with the people you're working with so that they can trust you. Because I think trust is a big thing as well. Being a consultant, showing up to someone's workplace and and showing them that you're part of their team, you're not you know, going against them, I guess. Absolutely, yeah, the, and, and trust is going back to athletics, right? In that team um, team mentality is is a huge part of that. So definitely something that's, that's vital to making sure the project is successful um, as well. Well, what, what advice would you give maybe a, a younger um, new graduate or someone who's looking to make a transition in their current career around entering consulting? Yeah, I would say the first thing would just be um, to be confident in what you know and your skills that you currently have and and, and market those and try to, to pull on your strengths as much as possible while also realizing that you're going to have weaknesses and you're you're not going to have the same experience level as a as a senior manager. So pulling on your strengths while also trying to build up your weaknesses or, or just learn new areas within consulting uh, would be the biggest uh, things to work on, I would say, and things that I try to do each day. Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you hit it on the, the nail on the head um, in the beginning of this conversation of looking to thought leaders or mentors within the industry and connecting with them. You always be shocked to see the amount of engagement that those stakeholders are always willing to give, specifically people that are interested in their craft. Yeah, for sure. And I would say that the effort that you put in is what you'll receive back from from those stakeholders and, and people. So if you show interest and and um, take some initiative, I think that um, only good things will will ever come, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. So what are some considerations in consulting that you that might not be the most glamorous thing that you would that you might warn someone about? Maybe warn isn't the right word, but you would kind of let them know the um the overall needs of a consultant yeah i would say that um there's a couple couple things to um, be aware of the first would be the travel uh, mm -hmm. it's not every week that you're traveling a bunch but you do i, I find myself uh, having to be prepared to to travel you know each week and because plans change quite often and, and mm -hmm. when you have multiple projects going on at once you're trying to make sure that each project gets adequate amounts of time and effort. So trying to schedule around your travel and, and knowing that, you know, you could be in New York one week and the totally opposite side of the country the next week. But um, that and then hours with multiple projects come lots of hours in a work week. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think just working on your time management skills before mm -hmm. getting in the mix of multiple projects would be really something to focus on and and something to be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. That's definitely two of the pieces that often come as a surprise. The amount of travel, um, the timeline around travel can be quite a quick turnaround. And then also having to manage the hours, um, especially for invoicing, because those have to be transparent. And that's a lot of the reasons why our clients work with us is because of our transparency around resourcing and billing. So definitely two really good points there. Right. And, and to go off of the travel, it's also like a huge pro as well. So it's not like, like a negative. It's very fun, too. Like, I really do enjoy it. It's a, a nice way to get to experience different places and meet different people from those places. So it's uh, it's definitely not all negative, but uh, something to be aware of if you're looking to join the industry. 
Oh, for sure. Yeah. Um, my poor husband, who's also a consultant, had to quarantine in Aruba for five days. So it was terrible for him. Fishing boats, yeah, all sure. kinds of I was like, if you send me another picture of the beach, I'm just going to lose it over here. So there's lots of perks to uh, working with our, our global um, clients as well. And we also have our offices in the UK, South Africa, and then the APAC region as well. So um, can really hit a lot of basis with our, our global team. Um, well, thanks so much, Jordy. Is there any kind of closing thoughts that you'd like to share with the audience about your experience here at Third Stage or any additional advice you'd like to give? I think that just if you're a, a recent college graduate looking to enter, whether it's consulting industry or, or anywhere, just uh, just know that no one's really going to find the opportunities for you. It, you have to kind of take it upon yourself to, to find those opportunities and ways in to uh, to reach your career goals. So. That would just be the only closing remark I would leave. Excellent. Well, I mean, this is Eric Jr. right here. Soon we'll be having you on <laughs> um, all the videos and all the podcasts too. So, <laughs> well, thanks so much, Jordy, for joining us again. That was such a great conversation, and I'm excited to hear Eric's feedback on it. Um, so, Eric, I had no idea that Jordy found you on TikTok, and that's the reason that he works at Third Stage now is because you're such a TikTok celebrity. Yeah, I, I think he's, I, I'm pretty sure he's the first person we've hired from TikTok or the one that we can attribute to TikTok. I know we found lots of people on LinkedIn and maybe even Instagram, um, certainly YouTube, of course. But uh, yeah, I think he is the first uh, through TikTok. So it just goes to show that the power of uh, social media is is pretty broad. Yeah, and definitely the follow through on that, how he talked about, then he followed you on LinkedIn and then he reached out and kind of his advice about taking that initiative if you want um, to be in the, a world of consulting. And and I think you you have a little Eric Jr., as I called him, in there on your hands because he, you know, is definitely um, very well, very well spoken. And also he really truly understands consulting and has that transparency about this is the type of considerations you should look at when going into consulting. We talked about the travel and just how you have to embrace and really be hungry to learn from the people around you um, and embrace the unknown. You know, sometimes there won't be things that you know the answer to, but that's why you have a team supporting you and in that opportunistic to learn from things. And then also, you know, having the ability to work across industries. He talked about, you know, the food and beverage manufacturing project that he's working on um, and some other different projects and industries he's crossing. And I, I think that's just so cool as a young professional to have that opportunity to learn from so many different areas across verticals. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And a lot of what you said, there's a, there's a lot there. I mean, one is the his persistence, you know, his, his persistence was, was memorable and that it stood out. So I felt like I kind of, I, I knew who he was and I knew what he is about because he seemed, he was fairly persistent in his, in his uh, communication. So that was one thing because it, you know, I get, I don't know, maybe a dozen messages a day on, you know, LinkedIn, email, YouTube or whatever, people wanting a job or wanting career advice or whatever. So it, it's hard to stand out um, when there's that volume that I just can't, respond to everyone. And I apologize to those of you that may have reached out and I've, I haven't responded. It's just because I get so many messages, I, I can't keep up with them. Uh, but there's something about, and I don't, honestly, I don't recall exactly what it was other than his persistence and he was very articulate and it just, he just seemed like he'd, he'd be someone worth exploring or talking to. Um, so I think that's, that's super important. And then you, you were also touching on the sort of the intangibles of consulting. You know, there, there's so many intangibles that he probably didn't learn in school, but it's sort of a core part of his personality there's something about his temperament and his just his personality and the way he operates and thinks that that i think makes him a good consultant so um you know so there's a, there's as much art to consulting in my opinion as there is science in fact the art piece of it and the intangibles are in my opinion more important than what you do or don't know on the technical side for sure well, I think there's an opportunity for a follow-up, as I always like to say, um, because we do have a lot of collegiate or former collegiate athletes here like Jordy. Um, and I know you and, and Khalid Morris, who's a director here, had talked about that. But there seems to be like a, a really interesting correlation between the discipline of athletics and the overall job function of consulting. Do you feel like that's true? Yeah, for sure. I, I um it took me a long time in my life to realize this. And because when I was growing up, I did mostly um, individual sports. So I was a runner. I did cross country and track primarily. 
But then as I was older, like as I got in my twenties and thirties, I started to do more like football and just amateur, you know, obviously I'm not, and I'm not good at any of it, but uh, basketball and football and things like that. I got more into uh, team sports as I got older, as I've gotten older and see my kids grow up and they both play team sports. That's all they do. They do football and basketball. So um, seeing them learn and how, you know, some of the skill sets they've learned has taught me the importance of those team skills. So anytime I see someone that was a collegiate athlete and they could perform at that level and operate as a team at that level, or someone who's a coach, you know, I, I always catch, it catches my eye when someone says they coach a, you know, a youth baseball team or a youth soccer team or whatever it is. Um, that's appealing too, because to be able to coach a bunch of kids, um, if you can coach kids, you have a higher degree of being likely to coach executives and things like that. So, um, so yeah, I think there's a, there's definitely a strong correlation. If you're trying to further your career, or if you, if you have an athletic background, I would totally play that up and make sure you highlight the strengths of that because most people don't do it. Most people don't have those lessons and just to be able to stand out and perform at that level, it, it, especially if it's a collegiate level, that's, that's pretty amazing in my opinion. Absolutely. It's almost like Jordy mentioned, that team approach is very similar at, at third stage. So it was easy for him to kind of assimilate into leaning on and gaining that trust. And as he mentioned, which was so wise for his years, that trust is what makes you a good consultant and garners the ability for you to make an impact for the client. Yeah. And that's really the piece that that always surprises me when I talk to young professionals here at third stage. They are so dedicated to making sure that the client is successful and see themselves as a part of the client's team. So I obviously was blown away um, by him, which we all are here. So um, definitely a good find on TikTok, Eric. Well done. Yeah, well, he, he found us. So well done to Jordy. And uh, thanks thanks for <laughs> leading that discussion. And thank you, Jordy, for, for being here as well. That was a good conversation. It's always interesting to see those unique perspectives of someone who's just starting out. It's also a good reminder to me, you know, it's a, hearing someone like him talk about it, it, it sort of continues to renew my love of consulting and, you know, why I got into it in the first place and stuff. Sometimes you, you tend to forget, you know, why did, why, how did I get here? Why am I doing this? And then you, you hear someone like Jordy talk about it and you think, oh yeah, you know, those are some of the, he exactly. touches on a lot of the reasons why I love the industry so much. So good, good conversation. So yeah, it, it kind of reunited my, my fire too. So I totally, um, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. Well, thank you for, for that conversation and thank you to the audience for being here today. Uh, we're going to wrap it up now, but I appreciate everyone being here. And, and uh, again, you can find new episodes of the show every Wednesday. So be sure to check us out and subscribe, share it with colleagues, give us a review, give us feedback, ask questions. We love the engagement. So thank you for that. And I uh, hope you have a great week and we'll see you next week on another episode of Transformation Ground Control. Take care. AI's role in creating new be beetles. Let me try that again. Off to a, mm -hmm. off to a solid start. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs>